thank you all so much for coming out for our panel this evening on the Hair Equity Project. Um, my name is Taylor Small. I use she and her pronouns, and I'm the DEI director at UVM Medical Center focused on health equity and community engagement. And today we're going to be focusing on one of, one of the projects that uh, UVM Medical Center has been working on, um, addressing racism at the root, as we like to say. Um, and before we get into introductions for our panelists, um, I would love to give a quick overview of what the project is, and then we can get into a deeper discussion as to uh, how we can implement this in other communities. For every patient, being clean equals health in terms of hygiene, preventing infection. And people are coming in bloody from accidents and no one felt like they could get all the glass out of their hair or the blood off their head. Without the products, we were causing harm. I had a client that was discharged from the hospital and because the hair was not careful, they end up having a knot in the back of the hair. So they had to shave that side of the hair because there was nothing we could do to save it. If you're not meeting the basic needs of a patient, regardless of their race, regardless of their needs, they aren't going to trust you. And that will not just be within the hygiene world. It might not just be your hair care. It overlaps into all areas. When you tell a patient that you have you don't have you know the proper you know products to care for the hair, you telling them that you do not care fully about them. Now that we have the proper products and we have the training, that's telling them that I see you, I understand you, in order to better and properly care for you when you come in the hospital. The Hair Equity Project is an example of one of the things I love the most about my job. Not only does it help advance the UVM Health Network diversity, equity, and inclusion strategy, but it also is a really powerful example of what staff-led initiatives can do. It has the power to completely transform how we care for our diverse patients and communities. This project was long overdue. I'm so grateful to the staff that have been advocating for hair equity for years. Thank you for your dedication. Hair equity, I think, is a step in that right direction. It's a step towards, I'm looking at you, I acknowledge you, and I want to help you in the best way that makes you feel good, comfortable, safe here, as best as I can, as a healthcare professional, because that's what I'm here for. That it was truly just a brief overview of the project and even featured our panelists, as you'll see. But I would love to give them the opportunity to introduce themselves um, and their role at either UVM Medical Center or with the project. And so, Alicia, I would love to turn it over to you first <laughs> for introductions. Hi, my name is Alicia Hill. I work as a medical lab scientist, mostly specializing in microbiology right now at the University of Vermont Medical Center. I've also been involved in DEI work in this institution since maybe 2017. Pascal. Hi, my name is Pascal Ongende. I am an owner of Braids by Pascal. It's located in Winston Road. I am a hair expert in equity project here and also one of the vendor of the few products that it's been used in hospital currently. And an outstanding braider, as I'm understanding, <laughs> um, but I think we'll be humble enough not to brag just yet. Um, I'll turn it over to you next, Vanessa. I'm Vanessa, and I use she, her pronouns, and I am the executive assistant for, the, for a few different associate chief medical officers, as well as the medical staff office as a department itself. Um, and I'm also one half of the leads for uh, the um, BIPOC Employee Resource Group, which is actually called the REACH Employee Resource Group for Racial Equity and Cultural Humility. 
everyone. My name is Ali Castile. Uh, I work as an LNA at Home Health and Hospice, as well as on Miller 3 in the Cardiovascular Neurology Unit um, at the hospital. And uh, I am also very privileged to work with Vanessa as one of our co-leads for the REGRG. And it's wonderful to be here. Thank you all so much. And I think it really getting at the end of the video there, Dr. Leffler came forward and said this was a push from staff, recognizing that this is long overdue. And I think, I think just to get us started and level set for the group, I don't think people often think about hair care as part of the health care um, continuum. And so, Vanessa, I'd love to turn it over to you first and wondering how did the Hair Equity Project come to be? Yes. So. Even though it seems as this type of um, lack of care is pretty obvious to the people who suffer through it and who aren't getting the resources that they need, um, it just was overlooked for so many years. And so even though it was a known issue within the circles that it impacted, um, it wasn't until an assistant nurse manager, Laura Dottilio, went to a health conference and she was able to see another organization, um, Children, Children's National in Ohio, uh, what they had done and how, what they brought to their hospital. And so she took that information from that um, presentation, it was a poster presentation, and she brought it back to our organization and brought it back to the employee resource group. And we really ran with it from just um, like Dr. Leffler said, staff members who um, are really at the heart of the issue. And so. It just, it shows that, um, I, I really like that it came from a poster presentation because it shows that um, DEI initiatives, what we're doing here, can impact, have such a, a, a wide impact, um, especially in Vermont where perhaps our numbers of um, the global majority are a little bit smaller than in other areas, but to have other organizations that could look at us as an example and, and take an, a project like ours on is just great to think about. That is amazing to hear that it went from, well, I'm sure hearing these issues already in the hospital setting and then being able to stumble across a poster that says, here's how you can address these issues. Mm -hmm. um, how, how were you all able to implement this? Um, what were some of the obstacles came, that came up? Um, what were some of the opportunities that you saw? I guess um, an obstacle that so this project really kind of went underway last year. That's when we started putting a, a lot like, towards the end of last year. But we had actually discussed this um, because Laura Dottilia brought it to um, an employee resource affinity space and um, brought it to our attention and asked if anyone wanted to, to help her <laughs> take this on. And, and we were part of, um, it was a, a BIPOC ERG. Um, so, like, you know, we identify with some of what she was trying to bring on. So um, there was a time when, like, we were talking about it and trying to figure things out, but we didn't really have any backing towards it, so it kind of, like, fell off and we kind of, like, lost traction there for a little bit. And then after, like, I don't, I don't know how many, it was like a few months maybe, I don't know, um, it started to gain traction again because there was a push to get outside resources in order to potentially continue to move this work forward. So it took someone who, yes, at first, you know, we asked for some buy-in, we had some volunteers, and then it, nothing really happened, and then it kind of fell by the wayside, but she kept pushing towards it and um, called in, I think, uh, the community um, health improvement department, and they actually started doing more work, and so this work started getting more traction. So um, it sometimes takes a very persistent person to not give up on something that, even if they don't necessarily fully, more personally identify with the project, they know how important it is to actually bring it forward. So um, that's what I'll say about that. And I think another obstacle that I um, experienced myself was um, just the initial researching. It was really important to find companies that we could work with that were black owned, um, women owned, and so reached out to these companies and we were trying to get free samples in because we had test participants who were going to use these products and give us our, their feedback on it. Um, but reaching out to all these companies trying to get their product in for free because we were working with a small budget. And so it 
that seemed, I forget exactly how long it took, but that seemed to be a bit of a stall, a good, a good amount of time spent on that. And it wasn't until we, we were able to secure funding to buy the sample products that we really got rolling with that um, testing period. And so I, I think that speaks to just, you know, having the funding right there from the get-go um, and how if you don't have the adequate backing, then that can really slow things down. One of the challenges that um, that I witness uh, in the healthcare direct and patient facing experiences is really bringing these experiences of other people into a framework that people who don't have these experiences actually understand and can not only conceptualize but really find the humanity in enough to educate themselves. Um, you know, we've We've ran uh, a workshop or two now um, around educating colleagues, uh, whether that's LNAs, um, medical assistants, those those folks, and I think it's it's a spectrum of consciousness that people bring. It's not everyone who understands the importance of hair equity. Um, people who do not have the textured kind of hair that we are aiming these projects and initiatives for. I think sometimes it can be very challenging. Um, I've had colleagues that I've shared this information with, our inpatient care guide that we put together as a committee, um, tell me, oh, we really don't need this. Like, we already went through this once. It's fine. Um, and that, I think, speaks a lot to the disconnect uh, that we run into a lot in DEI work. Uh, a lot of people um, who come from different backgrounds, especially in Vermont, where it is a very white state, but also at the same time, we have a lot of diversity coming in and, and a lot of really wonderful people, um, especially black and brown folks that give us the time, give us their energy, and in this case, really trusted us to show up for them. Um, and bring these products for them when they come to us and are in their most vulnerable states. So I think in a lot of ways, um, you know, I've had colleagues ask me where the products are on our unit on Miller 3, and they're very hands-on, ready to go, asking, what do I do? Where's the inpatient care guide? And then I've had other people um, not really grasp the importance of it yet. So it, I think it really speaks to the spectrum that we run into in DEI work, um, whether that's in the employee resource groups that we co-facilitate, Vanessa and I, or in other cases like this initiative beyond these spaces in the hospital, outside of the hospital. Um, and, and I think that speaks to the level of commitment that our team as a whole has really um, been able to persist and, and really make this happen and so we're we're very grateful for for Pascal being here for, for making it possible um, for giving us a chance as an institution um, and I think as we move forward um, it is going to be a challenge to continue to, to educate people and also do it in a way that's equitable for, for people who live through this experience um, where they're not responsible as the sole educators, but we are inspiring people to educate themselves and join us in. Tell us how you got involved with the Hair Equity Project. Um, I think when it first started, it kind of um, flew through my ear. Um, mm -hmm. I, I heard a little murmuring because I am also a former of um, UVM. I'm also a UVM former employee. So I have um, friends that still work in a hospital and I have of course, many clients. I mean, I'm, I'm the best in the state. I'm joking, but <laughs> <laughs> I have, I have a, you know, a good amount of percentage of clients in the hospital. So when this project first got to me, I was beyond excited. I was so excited, but I was at the same time very scared that it's not going to come to pass. It's just going to be one of those mm -hmm. subjects that they highlight for attention and just sweep it under the rug like everything else. Um, so after a few months, as um, Alicia mentioned, everything died down. So in my spirit, I was like, yeah, here we go. It's not going to happen. Mm -hmm. But I was very excited towards the um, end of last year. Although it's my very busy season with the holiday, 
I cleared my schedule and told them I am involved 150%. And like, I am here anytime, any day that you guys need me. So that's really uh, how I, I got into it involved. I, I think they have already did a lot of um, stage by the time I got involved. So they already did um, most of the trier into um, certain products. So they started with like, the shampoos and the conditioners. And then when the, uh, they approached me, so I made them realize that hair care is more than just shampoo. It's more than just conditioner. It's uh, the proper way to you know comb your hair. There's a proper way to detangle your hair. There is different um, texture for each person. You know, it, it doesn't matter what, you know, if it's a black person, a brown person, a, a, a mixed person. So every person have a unique texture and each textures have to be care, care for in a specific way in order to you know, keep the hair healthy. So that's when in, I brought in like combs and detangle brushes and bonnets to sleep on. So many uh, different things that we were able to, to work into um, building the, the classes and teach the classes that we, we taught, we taught a couple classes um, within the main campus and outside of the main campus and shot videos and um, so it, 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 it was an exciting, still an exciting experience for me. And by shooting videos, are you saying tutorial videos? Tutorial videos. So there is actually, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, there is a tutorial video that mm -hmm. is available uh, for all the healthcare personnel in the hospital that they can watch at any time. I, I believe that was such a great idea because it's not every day that you know we have to have a, um, a physical person to teach each person. And the hospital is broad, it's big. So having that in the system, I, I really feel like it's, um, it's reachable to many more people that it's not everyone that work at the main campus, so we have many, many different locations, so everyone is um, having access to that. That is amazing, and thank you for sharing that vulnerability of uh, coming into the project and saying, I, I didn't know if they were actually gonna follow through on this one, and even having that, that loss of hope there in the beginning, as so often happens in these projects. Um, but tying back to you being the best in the business, you have a lot of folks who are already in the hospital setting. Um, what, has this, what has this meant to the community, to have the Hair Equity Project, to have folks who are trained, um, and to have inclusive products available for a variety of hair types at the medical center? I, I, I really believe that many of us underestimate the importance of your hair. Mm -hmm. Like, we, we, we go into the hospital with um, the idea of um, healthcare just being um, medical. So it's just like I walked in, I have a fever, and, but I don't know how long that fever is going to take me. I may be there for two hours, I may end up there for two weeks, but I don't wanna walk out of there with a new health issue with this, my hair. I don't wanna lose my hair, because my hair is part of me. It's, it, it, Personally, I will speak to me. My hair, it's, if my hair is not properly cared for, I'm having a mental breakdown. Mm. I wouldn't show up today if my hair was not done. <laughs> I probably wear a scarf or a hat because I don't want anybody to see me in such a vulnerable position. I don't want to expose myself in, in, in a weak stage. So I, I feel like the hair care is health care. Mm. Hair care is part of health care because it's, it's both physically and it's mentally and it's emotionally to many people. And I know many people that have uh, breakdown and crying because they have lost an inch of their hair or they have lost two inch of their hair. And imagine people that you know leave ICU and have to shave one side of hair and some of them have to shave the whole of their hair because it was not cared for. I mean, if we are caring for people, then we need to completely care for people. We cannot partially care for people. We can't care for certain area and ignore certain area. Like everything has to be careful. 
Gosh, I feel like that message in healthcare keeps coming up that we separate different parts of our body as not being part of the wholeness of who we are. And, yes. and hair is so inclusive of that. Um, looking to other folks on the panel, what, what other impacts have you seen for patients or, or even thinking of providers and having this project available? I think having this project happen and be available and be somewhat more known um, over these last few months, I think it's really helped us kind of have conversations that may not have happened before this point in time. Um, like a few of us have been able to, you know, do some trainings or present to different areas within the hospital themselves. And sometimes, at least I can speak from my own experience, um, you know, I was presenting to um, a group and there were a few people who had very curly hair, but they identified as white. And so I was like, do, do you know that there are different hair types? And they have no idea. And so I'm wondering, like, you're an adult, how have you been dealing with your very curly hair? And it's just like, they just kind of powered through it or had to figure it out. And it's like, we get to have that conversation of like, yes, um, black and brown and BIPOC mixed individuals have this hair predominantly, but it stems further out than that. So learning how to care for this type of hair, it, it I, f I feel like it's, it's so broad, like it opens up so much more for other people to kind of understand that, you know, phenotypical differences aren't always like so separate. And so I guess that's what I'll say about that. <laughs> that was a really great point. <laughs> I think um, from my own experiences as a care provider, I feel more respectful approaching my patients, uh, having the equipment that I need, the supplies that if they have inquiries about, you know, we, we have kind of like a main medline stream right now in our product section before these products from Mixed Chicks. and. Um, as Alicia just pointed out, you know, it's, it's beyond the ethnicity of somebody, but it's also really important to acknowledge the history and, and the current present um, inequities that happen to black and brown folks. So with that in mind, you know, it's been, it's been really um, profound to just witness someone's expression change when you offer those products, when they perhaps feel seen in a way that they didn't feel seen before or it, uh, valued in a way where, you know, we, we oftentimes um, speak about healthcare in, in very abstract terms of it being a business as well as being so personal. And so when you're in a room with somebody to, to have the option to say, if these products don't work for you, or I'm noticing, like I'm wondering what kind of hair care you do at home, and to have options to offer to people, um, it really impacts their trust in a way that I think before it was very hard to bridge the gap, especially as someone who has very straight hair, very thick hair. Um, and so I think it's helped me personally as well as my colleagues on Miller 3 I can't speak to, to the whole hospital, but the people that I worked with directly to develop and cultivate more of the cultural humility piece and, and more of understanding that, you know, when, when I go to the store, for example, um, I don't have an issue finding things that are somewhat collaborative with my hair type. Uh, but it, it changes my perspective, just witnessing the challenges that people go through who have the coiled or kinked or curly hair um, types that oftentimes run into incredible damages in their hair when they come to our hospital. Um, so I think in a lot of ways it gives hope to colleagues and myself personally, who also works in home health and hospice, to see it expand from the hospital so we can reach people in more walks of life beyond acute care setting or, um, you know, intensive care. Um, and it really brings up back to the points that we were making of how um, 
Western culture, Western medicine, oftentimes will separate different parts of the body in healthcare categories, but really everything is so interconnected. Um, so mind, body, spirit, whichever um, philosophy or cultural understanding of health that you come with, I think it is really important to acknowledge that for some people, hair care can be very spiritual. And so when you think about you know, the message that you're bringing as a care provider um, to initially say, you know, I'm sorry, we don't really have anything other than these products that will potentially damage your hair and might traumatize you a little bit more than what you're already dealing with when you come to us. Um, I think it's really a gift to, to witness and, and to also experience my own learning curve in this process as someone who does not have those kinds of hair types. And I can speak um, not as an employee, but as a patient. Um, I a few years ago I had a hospital stay, and it, you know, anytime someone is staying overnight or longer in the hospital, it's it's pretty vulnerable at time, depending on what is happening. And so, I went into um, I went into the hospital, had surgery, had to stay there, and I just knew that the the products that they had there were not going to serve my needs, and. I didn't really give it much thought, you know, thinking back because that it often happens. Um, you're often faced in um, you often face situations like that um, when you're black or brown. Um, and so, but thinking back to it, you know, if I had had the products, it would have just helped a little bit to feel more comfortable. Even though even I worked at the hospital at that time. Um, I worked in the OR actually um, in my past, but going through it, it was just a very scary experience. And so not having everything that you need readily available will set a patient back. It will, even if it's not you know, right at the surface, even though I wasn't having those thoughts, it, it will um, affect the trust that a patient has um, on some level, even if it's not um, you know, very um, obvious. Or, um, and so that's, really, I think, uh, just even though the patients might not use the products every time they're in the hospital, just knowing that they're there, you feel seen, you feel like you're um, going to have the best care rather than maybe subpar where maybe you'll get the care that you need. Um, and so it just builds trust, which is very important for any kind of service that you walk into the hospital for. And I'll say your, your point is, well, first, thank you so much for sharing your own story and, and being a patient and, and what was coming up for you. And I think your story highlights that, that piece of you went into the hospital not expecting those products to be there. You weren't going to ask for said products. Um, you just were like, they're not going to be able to support me when I'm going into it. And so it's amazing how these small acts can build such a, a great build of trust um, mm -hmm. with patients along the way. And Ali, I think that was exactly your point as well. It, it really just takes this consideration, this understanding or curiosity to be able to build that trust. Speaking of trust and trusting the process, you, you all trusted the process to stick <laughs> with this project and get it to um, where it is today. But if if you could go back and start everything over with all the knowledge that you have now, um, is there anything that you would do differently? I don't know if there's anything that I, I that I would do differently. I think um, we've, as a committee, we have reflected on the whole process, and we we're still in the middle of that reflection. Um, and I think there are things that we've identified that could have helped um, the process be a little smoother. And um, a, a lot of that has to do with resources, has to do with um, really knowing what you're getting into before you start it. And you know, sometimes that's just not, not possible. <laughs> but I think most of us, I'll speak for myself, um, going into this project, I didn't think it was going to require all the time and um, energy and focus um, that it did require. And, I, and so um, knowing what we know now, uh, um, I think a little bit more attention on um, structuring it to, um, to hopefully offset the, 
the amount of, um, uh, I, I can't think of the word, but just um, so that it's a little bit more knowing what's going to come in the beginning, you know, um, without it, we kind of just rolled with it. <laughs> um, and, and we got here, <laughs> it was very successful, but it definitely was a journey. And um, luckily, something that we're all passionate about, so it was very enjoyable. But um, yeah, I think we'll definitely take some things from this and apply it to the next project that we have. It's hard to, to think of what would I do back then with what I know now, because it's hard to, because I was like, all the decisions that I made was what I, that was the decision I was gonna make with the information that I had. So trying to kind of bridge this, I think I would not have done anything differently because of the experience that I still kind of have in the back of my head, right? Like this project is done. We've done a lot of trainings. Um, I think it's, it's been a little bit more widespread. But with each passing uh, goal post, I was like, okay, we're, we're continuing. We're going to keep going. We're going to keep going. I'm going to keep going. If we're going to keep going, I'm going to go. So I, I couldn't see myself stopping because I was burnt out. I couldn't see myself stopping because I wasn't getting compensated, because this project meant so much to me based on the fact that I identify with the vulnerable hair types in which um, this project was, was centering and, and lifting up. So um, I, couldn't, I, I couldn't see me not continuing this work um, because I felt like if I dropped the ball, who was gonna pick it up? Mm -hmm. And if you pick it up, are you, gonna, are you gonna give that lived experience that might be needed to kind of flip it and have us go further? Because I wanna keep going. Like I want everyone to know about this because at the end of the day, I think there are some people who feel like hair isn't important because maybe you spend five minutes and you scoop it up, but you know, being bald is a statement, cutting your hair is a statement, dyeing your hair is a statement. Like, hair is so, even for people who like, you know, they don't like to, you know, buy and could be a part of consumerist culture. Like, would you shave off all your head? Would you shave off all your hair if you could, if your hair is, you know, down to your, you know, your um, bra strap or, or um, down to like your butt? <laughs> um, and I, I think about that um, when I do approach these spaces because I'm like, I want to bring that consciousness to the forefront that hair is a lot more important than you think just because I might have to spend 10 hours, six hours <laughs> on my hair. <laughs> you know, doesn't mean because someone spends 10 minutes that, that they don't care about their hair. You care very much about your hair. You just, it's just the time frame in which you have to get your hair done to the extent that you would like to look presentable um, and worthy of praise even just for yourself, of looking in the mirror and feeling good. Um, I think that that's what I want. That's how I feel about if I would have done this differently. The answer is no. Um, I think I, I probably, I couldn't agree anymore with you because There was, I cannot see an area where I would have changed anything because I have never seen a group of people so determined to achieve something in life. I mean, this is people that was working their normal shift at a hospital and still on the phone with me at 6 p.m., 8 p.m. I mean, there's one of them here. I will text her. <laughs> she, she will text and, and call at any time. And we will stay on the phone for, you know, random talk, you know, just like it, it became part of me, you know. And knowing what I know about hair, I wouldn't change anything. Because changing things would mean changing this project and I don't think there's nothing there's, there's anything that we can change about this product. This product project have achieved what it needed to do and I think it's, it's people are yet to see how important this is. You know, this is. Now here it's I, I tell people your your hair it's it's a crown. Like I get up in the morning sometime, I don't think about what I'm wearing. I will pull up any pants from any drawer and put it on 
but I think about what my hair look like <laughs> the night before I go to bed. What am I gonna do with my hair? What is my hair gonna look like? I'll wear the same black shirt for three days, I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> my hair has to look a certain way. So it, it's really, really important. You know, as, as Vanessa mentioned, I had children at, at a hospital, and I'm gonna tell you today, Packing my hair care bag was more important than packing my hospital bag. <laughs> <laughs> I would make sure that my bonnet, my cream, my shampoo, everything is packed because my kids are notorious. They're all premature. So I packed my bag at 20 weeks. My oldest came at 27 weeks. So I learned my lesson from there that <laughs> This kid's never gonna wait for 39 weeks. So my bags is always packed ahead of time because I knew that they're not gonna have what I need. Mm. They will have the baby blanket if I don't pack it. They will have the socks for the baby if I don't pack it. But they won't have the hair bonnet for me. Mm. You know? And, and even though I was worrying about my health, I was worrying about delivering this baby but now I have to also worry about what my hair look like. But now, people can go to the hospital and mothers, don't worry about what your hair gonna look like. Just worry about delivering that baby. I'm not worrying about the nurse coming in five hours after C-section and seeing my hair standing up like um, Sanguku. I don't know what cartoon I can use. You know the one that is. <laughs> <laughs> like, you know, like the hair just, you know, looking not so presentable. Yeah. So I, I, I feel like I wouldn't change a thing, but I, I miss those eight o'clock texts, Christine, just, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to throw it out there, just you know. Oh. <laughs> Thank you, Pascal. Um, this project, the process of this project has really inspired me to think about how we can show up for our colleagues and our community members um, with intention, um, with appreciation, and valuing their wellness overall in the process throughout it. And I think um, I just want to commend everyone in, in our committee because it's it's been um, a lesson within a lesson within a lesson. There there are many layers to this process to any initiative in healthcare. Um, hair, you know, like uh, as many people have alluded to today and, and just in general in this process, hair is very over sensationalized and yet at the same time it's very undervalued in a lot of spaces. And so I think one of the main pieces that I would have personally um, done differently, owning my own part in it, would have been to really reflect on the labor that goes into this work for people who live this experience um, and to set up parameters for them to be compensated um, in the ways that, that they deserve. And I think that was a lesson for all of our committee. Um, I think to Alicia's uh, point where it's very hard to go back and consider something that you would do differently with the information you have now. Um, because I think we were learning on the go and, and constantly. And um, I think that I had many moments personally where I thought I learned something, really understood it, and then it switched completely. And then it was, that was a different lesson for me. And that was really important to embrace um, as someone who is has distance from the project personally with with the hair type that I carry hair types that I carry and so I think in in many ways um, it helped me ask myself how do I want to show up for people and and how do I want to show up for people that um, carry intergenerational trauma and also intergenerational strength and joy and an incredible um, power within their their own beings and, and how they communicate you know the steps that that will make this become equitable and, and make this work uh, be possible so 
I think in many ways I, I hold similar sentiments of as a collective, I don't know. I don't think there is anything we really could have done differently beyond really asking ourselves what is equity work in an institutional setting that has history of participating in eugenics? You know, what is equity work when it comes to bringing work to people who live these experiences? What does that look like in every layer that this touches, whether it's in community or within the hospital internally? Um, so I think in many ways, um, it's, it's been really a, a privilege to, to believe in the work that we're doing and also believe in the people that I'm doing it with, so. Thank you so much. And uh, this will be my primer to the audience. So we're gonna have some time for Q&A here shortly. Um, but I do have one more question before we turn to the audience Q&A, which is, um, what, what advice would you give to the folks either watching this online or in the room today if they either want to start a hair equity project at their organization or if they have a similar passion project and are just wondering on how to get it off the ground, um, what would your advice be to them? I guess I would say that um, leading with intention is important mm -hmm. um, because to me, like moving forward with with equity projects you kind of you know how you have to have a why behind it even if you you know personally identify or you know someone who personally identifies with whatever equitable space you're trying to create um, I think that um, it's important to acknowledge that because you are going to need support so you're going to need buy-in you're going to need people to say yep yeah, I believe in exactly what you're doing your intentions match what I would want to collaborate on spend time on resources financial, monetary, or physical, or mental. Um, so knowing that that's what, knowing why you're doing this work, um, I think is important because you'll have to be able to recite it over and over and over again. So it, it, it's gotta be something that means something to you. It can't be something that you've written on a piece of paper as an objective you need to check off. Um, because you know, you're going to be put in very uncomfortable positions. Um, you're going to be told no. I mean, rejection is hard. Um, and you're going to have to keep going, right? Because at the end of the day, if you drop this, and you probably know if you're getting into equitable work, like, is it going to continue? Is someone going to do something completely different? Like, I, I think that that's what I would want to say to anyone even trying to, to start this work. Like, really be clear on why you want to start it, because it is something that you're gonna to have to carry through the discomfort, through the fatigue, through the joys, um, through the strains, through the, I don't know if I can continue doing this, um, and the ups and the highs and the victories. Like you're gonna carry that why throughout, throughout the entire space and you're gonna to touch a lot of different people with this work. So I think it's important <coughs> to have that. I think it's also important to center those who are um, are at the center of it. So turning to those who know, um, who have lived the experience and who are able to contribute um, in ways that um, some others may not be able to. And I think um, Laura Dettilio is a perfect example of bringing that to the group. And then um, and just the organization backing us as well. It's just ha being able to really have um, the lead here and um, be able to steer it um, in the way that it needs to because of our, you know, Pascal being the hair expert, bringing in um, someone from the com community and um, who um, who just is embodies all, so many parts of this project. Um, so really making sure that you're turning to the right people and um, I think that's very important with any kind of DEI work. I think with with this work, the the main thought that I have is the power of collaboration with community and the importance, um, really echoing what Vanessa just shared, the importance of 
centering the people who live these experiences in a way where they have the leadership roles in these processes. Um, and I think with, you know, with Pascal's phenomenal work, as well as the participants in our project, um, they made it possible. Um, and it's really, it, it's opened a lot of doors for partnerships between the network and community members uh, to really see the different stages of collaboration that can really bloom if, if given the space and, and also given the space to stumble too. So. I'd just like to add on um, because it, it made me think about um, we talked about the testing phase, and um, but we didn't really get to the, the details of that. We, we um, had 15 people from the community. Some of them were employees, a few of them, um, but 15 people that tested these products and gave us feedback. We had 137 responses on individual products. And so we really listened to, you know, we, we didn't just um, make decisions based on what we thought, what a, a select few thought. Um, we really turned to the community and, um, and all of those test participants were, uh, as they were paid as well through the grant. So they were valued um, in more ways than just their, you know, their information using their sacred use of their body for, um, for our research. <laughs> but, yeah. for, for, for me personally, I would say that uh, coming into this project it, it, it was something that you have to be very passionate about. You have to make sure that you're not coming to this for reward. You come into this as a sacrificed lamb. You come into this because this is something that will be useful for many, many generations to come. Like I'm coming, I came into this not for me. I came into this for my daughter. Because I think of, she's born in Vermont. She's a Vermonter. You know, what I went through, I don't want her to go through it. I don't want her to have to leave Vermont because she thinks that she can't be careful the way that she needs to be careful. I want her to stay. This is her home. I want her to stay home and have her children and be home and be comfortable and have access. You know, so for me, it was, this have to work. So I came into this project as it's going to work. You know, I, I didn't think of anything as, you know, it's like you have to sacrifice. So you, you when you get into this kind of thing, you know, you, you think of it burns, it rain, I will rebuild this and you have to work and it will work. So, you know, as Vanessa said, it, it, it it's something that it, it takes a whole village to build the village, basically. That, that's how I looked at it. Gosh, thank you all so much. I mean, all of those messages tie so deeply together. And Pascal, I think you just wrapped it up in this beautiful package of centering your daughter in this, of look at the generations to come um, and who we are doing this work for. Um, that really, wow, that was very hard really. uh, I know we have a few minutes left, so I would love to turn to our audience and see if there are any questions. Um, yes. I have a question. Are the products readily available now to the patients? Do they have to ask for them? And are you feeling any hesitancy from the staff? I know having to watch a tutorial, sometimes, you know, it, it's a lot of care right now, especially there's less staff than there used to be. So for an LNA or a nurse or whomever caregiver, has to sit for however long the tutorial will take. It's like, oh, you know, I don't have the time. I've got six patients down the hall. Are you feeling any of that about the hair project? You're in touch, you would know. <laughs> no, looking, to, <laughs> looking to Ali. Sure. <laughs> um, I, appreciate, I appreciate that question because I think it speaks to the ongoing process of um, developing effective ways to roll out products. And I think right now we 
Uh, for example, on my unit, we have a specific section where we have these products available for staff to bring in. And we also have different hair charts across the unit at each nursing station for people to look at the hair type and know to offer it to people. Um, you know, one of the challenges that I have run into a few times has been finding these products in rooms where people have very straight hair or they have very little hair. And uh, I think that speaks to the gap of connection to the education piece that you're speaking to. Um, I think with the pushback that can happen, um, I can't necessarily speak to the the disengagement that some people may carry with them currently in their training or whatever else, um, the connection to the hair equity care. Um, but I think in a lot of ways, it does speak to the earlier comment that I made around the consciousness and, and shaping that and really acknowledging that people are in very different places when it comes to understanding the importance of educating yourself about it. Um, I think with the tutorials, I'm, I'm not too sure personally, the module that uh, Kristen Fontaine and Alicia Hill, as well as some other folks had put together was one of my favorites because it was very engaging and it was um, very informative. And so I think moving forward, we have super users on each floor and, and that is to connect the micro level of individual to the macro of the institution as a whole, where people on each floor who have signed up to take the super user trainings that we've offered and Pascal has kindly educated us through um, can be that link. So if we need supplies, the super users uh, can turn to the supply chain and say, hey, our unit doesn't have this or this. And I think it's it's a very, um, very layered process that we are still figuring out how to become more effective with. And we just started rolling out the products in February. So I think, I'm, I'm not honestly too sure of the specific percentage now that the trainers have spoken. I don't know if somebody from our committee can speak to that, but um, I think within a month and a half, there was about 50, a little over 50% of people who had taken it already. Um, so it is, I think that that's a really important question because it's something that I reflect on every time I go in on shift is to ask, you know, who has taken the training, who has the connection with the training and with the hair initiative specifically, um, and then how is that impacting our patient care, you know, so. I don't know if anyone else has anything they'd want to offer, but. I would just like to mention that the different trainings that we had, um, we did a, a lot of um, different styles to try to reach, to pe reach people's different learning styles. So mm -hmm. we had super user trainings, we had poster sessions with the nurses and, L and um, oh, we also did 15 minute quick um, instructions for LNA days, mm -hmm. skill days. Um, yeah. So we really did hit a lot of different um, modalities to try to get that information out. So hopefully, it, we also have the cornerstone, the training uh, module online with the video. Um, but hopefully if someone didn't doesn't respond to sitting down and, and watching something that they were able to go to a, a session where they had hands-on learning and, and were able to receive the info that way. So um, trying to get all the different, um, get the information out there in many different ways. I think we have time, yeah, for one other question. I'm gonna go right up here. Um, I don't have a question. Okay. But um, I wanted to say thank you for um, your passion and for your cons consistency in not giving up on uh, hair project, hair, <laughs> Uh, equity project. So I'm a, a former nurse in my days. This was not a thing. I'm not going to tell you when I graduated. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no. This is in the 90s. 
So a hair equity project in a healthcare uh, place was not something you talk about. But I can understand, being a, a black woman myself, I can understand and appreciate the work you're doing. And uh, this really, um, I, I, I'm really passionate about your project and I hope you continue to affect patients and clients uh, for a long time, not just the immediate people that are coming to the clinics, to the hospitals, to the healthcare, but also to carry this on for future generations. So I appreciate that. So I just wanted to say thank you for the hard work you're doing and for not giving up. So I think that's all I can say. Thank you. Thank you. I just have a comment. I hope you will spread the word. I heard you say that you heard somebody heard about it in Ohio. I, I looked online. I was really listening, but I did look online and saw that there are two short YouTube videos about the project. Mm -hmm. But I hope you are spreading the word across the country in healthcare about the power of this project because it is it is absolutely extraordinary. And the other, not only to healthcare institutions, but to professional preparation programs, particularly in nursing, but social work and other places to get, so I hope that, that in your spare time. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you for what you're doing, and I hope that you will continue. Well, we definitely, to sorry, to I know we're probably out of time, but. Um, that's exactly what I wanted you to <laughs> yeah, talk about. Yeah, well, to we are definitely um, trying to get the word out as best as we can. Alicia and I were just in Louisiana. We were in New Orleans um, to present at a, a large health equity um, conference there. Um, Kristen just um, submitted uh, an abstract for another large health um, conference in Minneapolis, mm -hmm. right? And so that will happen in the fall. Um, we've gotten calls from, I think it was like Kentucky. Yeah, there was, there's been inquiries for, uh, maybe you um, remember the state, but. I don't remember the state now. Some <laughs> southern know, Georgia, state. Maybe she was in Georgia, but yeah. 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 Yeah, so, it's Georgia. Okay. It's Georgia. Yeah, so the word Dartmouth, is getting out there. Dortmund as well, yes. Mm -hmm. so. yeah. Yeah. Oh, right. Yes. Yeah. I have one quick question. How about this? This is all pertaining to female. How about males? Do you address that in the same sense? Because men tend to have a lot of long black hair, and, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It does seem like there has been a large um, emphasis on um, women, but we did definitely consider, we did give consideration to men as well, and all genders. Um, so we did have at least one or two testers that were men, and um, mm -hmm. and the bonnets are definitely for any gender Everybody. because it, it will help for, um, you know, for close hairstyles, locked hairstyles, and um, so, I, that's a good um, point to make that they might get lost in, in the conversation, but we definitely gave them co um, consideration. And it's a, an ongoing project as well, so um, we, even though we've gotten over the, you know, we've gotten to one of the biggest hurdles, getting it out and doing the education, um, there's still going to be different phases that we will see where we might be lacking some attention and, and addressing it when needed to. And I think that answer just underscores the sustainability of this program and that with champions like you all and having some institutional buy-in behind this, um, we can make sure that the generations to come know that when they're receiving health care that their hair is also going to be mm -hmm. cared for. Uh, I cannot thank you all enough for being here this evening and taking time, more time out of your day to <laughs> spread this news. Um, it, I have learned so much and uh, it is just such a pleasure to work with all of you. And um, so thank you to Sal, yes, please. please. Thank you to South Burlington for putting on their first Juneteenth celebration. We look forward to that sustainability and growth in the future. Um, and I also want to thank the public library and the librarian who has brought a selection of books that are available right outside um, that focus on a variety of hair types. So please make sure to check those out. Um, and with that, that is the end of our panel, y'all. Thank you so much for coming.